It had been three long days. The echoes of the cross still filled the air. There was a darkness that was palpable. A sense of dread that was all-consuming. Fear permeated the landscape. Powered by an inconceivable loss, hope was dead. But in the distance was a sound. The sound of earth moving, of foundations rattling, the sound of God taking back the world he loved. Darkness had been flooded with light. Fear had been overtaken by hope. Death had been swallowed in victory. In that moment, sin lost its power. The grave lost its sting, and evil was left broken in defeat. He is victorious. He is triumphant. He is risen. Jesus is alive.
Amen, church. Hey, you can be seated real quick. Well, good morning. Good morning and happy Resurrection Sunday to all of you. It is a, yeah, amen. Hey, let's clap it up. We, we have reason to clap. We have reason to celebrate because today we celebrate what God has done. What God has done through his son, Jesus Christ. And not only that Jesus died for us and died for our sins, but that he beat the grave. He beat death. He beat sin. And today we celebrate that. And so we are really glad that you are here to worship with us today as we worship this risen king. Um, if you're a visitor, or you're a first time visitor, we want to say that we are so glad you're here. Welcome. We hope that uh, you feel comfortable here and that you're excited to be here. If you're not a first time visitor, if you're a third, fourth, fifth, 10th, 20th, whatever amount of times you visited, or you're a church member, we are glad that you're back. We are so excited that we're going to get to worship with you today, and so we just hope that you you feel welcome here and that you feel loved here um, as, as you are. We love you, and we're really glad you're here, um, but today we get to worship that king. Um, today we get to worship Jesus, and I just want to keep this worship going as we open up God's word out of 1 Peter chapter 3 where it says this. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Church, that Jesus is the one who beat the grave. That Jesus is who we celebrate. Will you pray with me today? Father God, we thank you. Oh man, Lord, we thank you so much. Lord, that, that today, um, especially today, but Lord, every day, we are just so blessed by you. Lord, that, that you saw us in our sin and in our iniquity and in, in our lost self, God, and that you, you made a way. God, that you changed us, that you changed this world because you sent your son, Lord, to live the life that we should live to die the death that we deserve, Lord, but it didn't just end there. It didn't just end with the death of your son, Lord, but it, it continued on in his life, in his resurrection, Lord, that we have new hope, new joy, new life for ourselves in your son, Jesus. And so today we thank you. And I pray that this worship would just rise up to you, God. You're worthy of all of it. Let us just pour ourselves out to you today, Father. We love you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. So Friday, I stepped in a hole and turned my ankle something awful. And uh, so if you see me gimping around, that's, that's why. And, um, and here it's Resurrection Sunday. And, and Jesus came back from a crucifixion. I can't come back from a twisted ankle. And so, but there's a notion out there with some people that would say, well, Jesus was, it was just like mostly dead on the cross and they took him off and he really was alive and then somehow he you know rolled the stone away and then presented himself to the the disciples i mean no no disciple would believe that's a resurrected jesus that looks like he was mostly dead i know nobody's looking at me limp around going yeah i'll follow that guy and so um i'm so glad that our savior conquered sin and death i'm gonna ask you to stand we're gonna sing some more songs and worshiping him
Matthew 28, 
Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen. He has risen indeed, church. Let's pray. God, we are gathered this morning because of the very true and all-powerful knowing that you indeed, Jesus, you sit at the right hand of the Father. You are alive indeed. Jesus, thank you for being so obedient and going to the cross to pay for our sins. Thank you, God, that because you live, we live. So this morning, I pray over this body of believers that we would recognize that truth, that we would be renewed in our mind and transformed in our lives so that we would live a life that truly demonstrates a resurrection that you have done through us as well. And for those who are still not seeing you for who you really are, may salvation come into this place today. I thank you, God, for this time. I pray that you would anoint Pastor Chris as he delivers a message for us. Incline our ears to hear and our hearts to be open to you. And pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, good morning, church. Man, so good to be in the house of the Lord uh, today. Um, you know, many times um, you'll hear people say, he is risen, and you're maybe not sure what to say. After that, he is risen indeed is a great answer. But I love to just say hallelujah afterwards, right? Just regardless of the language that you speak, when you say the name hallelujah, everyone understands, right? When we're in Honduras and we say hallelujah, they know we mean praise the Lord. When we're in Germany or Romania or Thailand, it's all hallelujah all the way. So we're going to practice, okay? I'm going to say he is risen, and you're going to say hallelujah. Okay, ready? He is risen. Hallelujah. Okay, pretty good. You are better than the first two, right? The sunrise service, they need to wake up a little bit, all right? They were a little slow in there. Like, can we do it one more time? But can you make sure that, like, Tori's house, the neighbor is actually here, all right? He is risen. There you go. He's worthy of our praise, right? So many ways for us to worship him, whether it's through the word, whether it's through proclamation with our mouth. We're just here to worship him. And there's such joy that can happen on this morning, right? Do you remember back when you were a kid? And remember what it was like on Easter morning, right? Here's what I remember. My mom used to always bring the same basket out every year. She still does, right? I'm 52, and guess what? My mama bringing me a bucket, all right, and you know what's in that bucket, right? Candy. Reese's eggs. Hallelujah, all right? I mean, delicious. I was like, oh, what I remember about this was just candy. You would just like eat. It was like as a kid, the greatest thing ever. But as I've matured and as I've grown in the Lord, right, it's turned from this Easter candy celebration into Resurrection Sunday. Right, this time to remember how I've traveled from, from once being a child into this maturity in Christ, or, or I'm getting there, <laughs> to the maturity in Christ, uh, to be able to say, like, this is about Christ. It's about family, the family of God, uh, my own family at home. This is just an opportunity we have to just step back and remember. You know, this last few weeks, we've had a chance to remember because our daughter Shelby is getting married in about a month, and so my wife has been putting together a slideshow from her, right? And I'm trying to watch March Madness. Okay, it is madness. There's upsets everywhere. And over here, I just hear my little daughter saying, God bless America, or just doing her little play, or doing a little dance, and I find myself like, Oh, like this, oh, the remembering, right, of doing Sermon on the Mound and, and co-op and all these just sort of things you just, you forget, right? 
Your kids grow up, and all of a sudden you're like, oh, where's the snuggles, right? They used to sit on your lap. Now they don't sit on your lap anymore. It's just like they, they, they drive to Thailand. I can't drive. I guess you get to fly there, right? But they head out around the world following the call of God, right? So today, I just, I just pray you'll have a chance to stop and remember, a chance to think back to those early days of just remembering how, how pure this day is to remind us that the cross, as incredible as it was, our sin paid for the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. His blood was shed for us because we all fall short. But today, he rose again. Death isn't the end. We can have life in him. Right? That's the good news of the gospel. And if you've been with us for a while, we've been walking through the book of Matthew Verse by verse, all the way from chapter 1, all the way through today. Next week we finish, right, with the Great Commission about going out, telling the world, making disciples of all nations. But we've been on quite a journey. So I want to give you a quick recap. Um, but I thought we would do it in a little bit of a creative way. Because I wrote a poem last night. Right, if you went to Hayes High School, you know I wrote a poem last night. But um, hopefully this kind of gives you a recap of all the things we've gone through in the book of Matthew. In the beginning was the word. Jesus came to dwell. God incarnate, the blessed king, our Emmanuel. God with us, born of a virgin, he came to remove the veil of sin that began long ago when Eve and Adam fell. He lived and taught through parables. His teachings and his examples were incredible. The Sermon on the Mount was unforgettable, but his life communicated more. It was impeccable. He said, you are the branches and I am the vine. Abide in me and live out my design. He said, you are the sheep and I am the shepherd. Trust in me because I am the resurrection. He said, don't stay in darkness because I am the light. Open your heart and in me you can delight since I am the way and the truth and the life because I conquered death in sinner's sight. He said, they wagged their heads at me and mocked. They threatened and challenged and scattered the flock, and they said, let God save him. And they stood in shock as darkness fell, and the earth rumbled at 3 o'clock. If they had only known, I am the door, they could have just simply not. But the Son of Glory died upon that old rugged cross. He came and lived and died to save the lost. And this is love, not that... We have loved God, but that he has loved us. He loved us, overcoming the cruel and evil and treasonous. He walked the path to Calvary to take my sin and set me free, and he did not despise that cursed tree. Glory to the blessed king. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me, was his cry. And with a profound it is finished, the Savior died, committing his spirit to his father, whom we magnify. Three days ago, the King of Kings died. Jesus, let him be glorified. And that's where we pick up the story. Jesus has just died upon the cross, and, and he's getting ready to be laid in the grave, and three days later, proclaim victory over the grave. And so we're picking up in Matthew chapter 27, and we're diving straight in. When the evening came, Jesus has just died upon the cross, just as the, as the the sacrificial lambs were slaughtered on the time of Passover at, at 3 o'clock. Jesus himself has died. And when it was evening, there came a rich man from Arimathea named Joseph, who was also a disciple of Jesus. So in comes this man, Joseph of Arimathea, right? His name was just Joseph. They, they declared the town so you wouldn't get him mixed up with other Josephs in our story. And he comes before Pilate and he's going to ask for the body of Jesus. So the question is, who is this Joseph, who is this new character that comes onto the scene of this? We learn a few things from this. He's a rich man. He's also a disciple of Jesus. But let's look at a couple of the other accounts. Look at uh, Luke chapter 23. We see, find out a little bit more about who this Joseph was. Now, there was a man named Joseph from the Jewish town of Arimathea. He was a member of the council, a good and righteous man who had not consented to their decision and action. And he was looking for the kingdom of God. So not only was he a disciple of Jesus, but he was a member of the council, of the Sanhedrin, the very people that stood and listened to all the false testimony about Jesus. And then they yelled, crucify him. But he dissented. 
He stepped away. He was a follower of Jesus, but he had to do it in secret for fear of the Jews. We learn that from John chapter 19. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission. So he came and took away his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. So we have Joseph, right? This disciple looking for the kingdom of God takes a chance, the courage to step forward and ask for the body of Jesus. He's stepping away from those who had yelled, crucify him, and it takes him to bury him. And, and so another guy shows up on the scene, Nick, Nick at night, right? Nicodemus shows up. You remember Nicodemus, right? John chapter 3, who he sneaks in to find Jesus and have a conversation with him. He's like, Jesus is like, you need to be born again. He's like, what? I've got to climb back. What? That's weird, right? And he's like, no, no, you've got to be born of water and of the Spirit. Because all of those things we list about jo Joseph, a righteous man, a rich man. He's blessed by God, they thought. He's a member of the council. We had power riches, influence. He was righteous. None of that can save him. None of that can fill in the gap. You see, our sin has dug such a great hole that no matter how many good deeds we do, no matter how blessed we are, we can never fill it. We need a Savior. Joseph understood that. Nicodemus here understands that, that this Jesus, I'm surrendering to him. All my riches, all my power, all my influence, my tomb, all these things, I surrender. I surrender my heart to Jesus. Picture of the gospel that we see right here. But did you notice that we're bringing 75 pounds of myrrh? Now, I don't know how many of y'all work out, right? But when I work out, I don't get the 35-pound dumbbells. I'm like, like, eh. I'm like 15, right? I'm like 15, yeah. Get it going, right? 75 pounds of myrrh and these oils in order to anoint Jesus' body. It says this in verse 40. So they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen cloths with spices as it was the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. So they wrap him in this linen cloth and they anoint him with his oils and they lay him in a tomb. And that's what Matthew records as well, was this, this act of Joseph and, and Nicodemus. It says this in verse 58. And he went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate ordered it be given to him. And Joseph took the body and wrapped it in a clean linen shroud and laid it in his own new tomb, which he had cut out. In the rock. Now, both of them mentioned this idea of a new tomb, right? Why, why would that be important? Why would it be important that Joseph laid Jesus in a tomb that had never been used before? Because Jesus is going to walk out of that tomb. There's no doubt who walked out of that tomb. If this was a tomb that hundreds of people have been buried in, people could question, oh, maybe that was my ancestor so-and-so, or maybe that was this person. No, no. No one had been buried in this grave. And Jesus himself didn't stay buried. He came back to life. So these little details are all meant to solidify in our heart and our mind that there's no doubt who this person was and what happened in this scene that's playing out before us. And then it says, and, a great, and they rolled a great stone to the entrance of the tomb and went away. So they would have had this channel that had this large circular rock that they would have pushed down the decline into the position to, to lock the tomb. We don't know how heavy this stone would have been. I mean, 75 pounds of alloy, maybe it was pretty heavy, right? Several hundred pounds or some people said up to a ton. That seems like too much because I've tried to move some of these rocks that are in our yard, not even a smidge, right? And there, so it couldn't have been too heavy, right? But there's there this rock that had been rolled there to signify to close up the tomb. And then, notice what it says. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were there sitting opposite the tomb. And so in the background, 
You may have noticed it last week at the cross. Mary Magdalene and the other Mary and the the mom of of the sons of Zebedee were all at a distance watching what goes on. And here they are again, tuning in, watching where um, Joseph and and, um, Nicodemus take the body and they're watching the stone be rolled in front. Why is that important? You're going to find out in a second that the resurrection of Jesus is so important that it changes everything. And the world is going to try to debate, it's going to try to disprove, it's going to throw theories out there that this event never actually happened. They say, no, 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 that, the resurrection didn't happen. In fact, Jesus didn't even die on the cross. That's one of the things the world will tell you. This is what's called the, the swoon theory. The idea that Jesus like, oh, he didn't actually die on the cross. Never mind the flogging scourging, never mind the nails through his hands and his feet, never mind the spear into his heart. They would say, he still survived. And then somehow in the grave, miraculously healed, and then was able to roll the stone away and walk out. That's the swoon theory. That's the idea that many false religions believe this today. They would say that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. He was either replaced by someone or that the swoon theory happened At what point does something become unbelievable? Because not only did these things happen to him on the cross, like the spear into his heart, but we see he's been drowned in 75 pounds of ointment, wrapped up in a cloth. We have a great stone put in front. And then, added detail, they're going to set a guard. So not only does this crucified man have to roll away the stone, but he's got to avoid the guard on the way out like nothing ever happened. Nah. Not going to go there. Because as we look at this scene, we're going to see it's more believable to that this actually happened. But do you believe it? Like, is that why you're here today? Because you're like, you know what? I believe this. I believe this event happened just as the Bible says it does. Because, guys, if this event didn't happen, we're to be pitied above all people. I mean, that's what Paul says. If you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, right, you see Paul's testimony To the Corinthians, before this, in the early part of chapter 15, he just lays out the gospel for him. He just says, "Um, for this I received, that Christ died according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and then he raised again according to the scripture, and that he appeared to Cephas, and he gives out this account saying, listen, you just have to believe. Christ died according to what the scripture just said. He was buried according to what the scripture said. Did you realize that Joseph, without even knowing it, fulfilled scripture? When you go back to Isaiah 53, um, verse 9, he actually fulfilled scripture. It says, and he made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death. Hundreds of years before, the Messiah, the one who had been pierced for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities, will be buried in a rich man's tomb. And here comes Joseph, not even knowing the the role he was going to play in that story, and he buries him in his own new tomb. But did he step out of that tomb? Because here's here's Paul's testimony. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. If Christ didn't raise from the dead, we're hopeless. We, We have no hope. Our sin is still upon us and that hole is too deep. But if Christ did raise from the grave, we have hope. Because look what he says. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Is your hope in Jesus only for this life? YOLO. Only this life. That's the only. You hope that when you follow Jesus, everything in your life is going to get better. Your debt problem is going to get solved. Your friend issues are going to get solved. Your your desire to be loved by someone is going to get solved. Your sin is no longer, that addiction is no longer going to be there. Guys, we follow Jesus because it's truth and because our hope is in heaven. Our hope is in eternal life. Now, does following Jesus help you overcome the things of this world? Absolutely. But it more helps you consider pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. You don't escape the trial. You walk through it with joy and confidence and peace in the midst of those trials. But, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 
For as by a, a man came death, and by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all died, so in Christ shall all be made alive. Woo! Anybody want more life? Like when you wake up in the morning, do you want to be like made alive? That that day you just face it like, woo, let's go, right? You see, when we have Christ in our life, it changes our perspective. If he really rose from the grave, that impacts every area of our life, how we live, how we talk, how we think. Everything about our life is transformed because of what he did on the cross and then his victory over the grave. That's the good news of the gospel. We can all have a, play a part in that. We can all participate in this amazing grace by putting our faith in Jesus, believing in our heart that God raised him from that, believing that this story we're talking about is true. Right? So they set a guard at the temple. Pick it up in verse 62. The next day, that is the day of preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered before Pilate, and they said, Sir, we remember how that imposter said, while he was still alive, after three days I will rise. Therefore, order the tomb to be made secure until the third day, lest his disciples go and steal him away and tell the people he has risen from the dead, and the last fraud will be worse than the first. So here's the second theory. This is the theory that they're, they're floating. The disciples stole the body. Now listen, you've been walking with us through the book of Matthew. Is there anything in the way the disciples live their life that make you think they're ready for this covert operation? <laughs> like, is there anything that makes you go, you know what? Those same guys that ran scared in the garden, one of them without his clothes. He's so scared he just leaves his cloak there. Those guys, or Peter, the one that you would think, this guy, he might charge in there, denied him three times before the rooster crowed. And is now walked away weeping bitterly because of his denial. That group of guys is going to sneak into the garden, avoiding the guard, roll away the huge stone, steal Jesus' body, and then somehow have the courage to say that he rose again. That group? I don't know. I'm not buying it. I'm just saying, what I've seen of these guys, it wasn't until after Christ appeared to them in glory. After he showed himself to them, then all of a sudden they found courage. But it wasn't until Christ returned, until Christ said, hey, here I am, walks through the door, eats some fish, right? Or walks in on the, makes some breakfast on the, on the beach for them. It wasn't until he said, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? That Peter was restored. And then on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit falls upon them, and now they're changed. Now they're different. That's not them yet. And so, I, I mean, I just, I'm going to say it's not believable to me. But verse 65 says, And Pilate said to them, You have a guard of soldiers. Go and make it secure as you can. And so they went and made the tomb secure by sealing the stone and setting a guard. Now, we don't know what kind of guard this was. Was this a Roman guard or was this a Jewish guard of people, right? And it just depends on how you think that Pilate said this sentence, right? You have a guard of soldiers, go make it secure. He's saying, you have a guard, you have the temple guard, which would have been somewhere between 10 and 24 men available. They had around the clock security at the temple all the time with the Levites and with others. So they would have pulled some of those guards over. That was very plausible for them. Or if you think that Pilate said, take a guard of soldiers and go make it secure as you can. There's some debate about the wording that goes on here. If it would have been, there would have been four Roman guards that they sent to guard the tomb. Two would stay awake while two slept, and they would rotate through the series. So whether it was four guards, 10 to 24 guards, or if it was a combination, which it kind of seems like it might have been a combination in this report that happens in chapter 28, there's anywhere between four and 28 people guarding the tomb. Right? Do you have the scene set? The tomb, the rock has been rolled. The guard is set. The seal, which to break the seal was punishable by death. The guards who would have either been killed if they had let Jesus escape, let the disciples come in, or they would have been burned to death in their clothing. That was the punishment for these soldiers for not accomplishing their mission and doing what they were required to do. That's the, the, the scene that's set before us. Now, after the Sabbath, towards the dawn of the first of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. 
Now, here's the third theory, saying that Mar the Marys went to the wrong tomb. They just messed up. They went to the wrong place. That's why they didn't find Jesus' body, because there was, they, were, they were at the wrong spot. Now, is that believable? Well, we've seen them at the cross off in the distance. We've seen them follow Joseph and Nicodemus to the tomb. There's a seal on the tomb. There's a guard set before the tomb. Do you think they went to the wrong one? To me, that's just, again, not believable. We've seen them throughout this whole story following Jesus. And behold, all right, picture it. Are you ready? And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. So here's the tomb. An angel comes. Kaboom! Are you picturing it? Like, I wish we had, like, like something in the floor that could make it rumble, like a 4D sermon experience, right? Like, we do the Red Sea and water splashes on your face. That'd be awesome. But I wish you could just feel the rumble, right? This angel comes down, right? Imagine that lightning, that summer lightning that just comes out of nowhere. And boom! Shakes the ground. This angel, bright as lightning, clothes white, Goes over to the rock, he's like, ah, move it over there. Hops up on it and looks out. That's what's happening. For him to move the rock was like, oh, yeah, let me move this little thing out of the way. Whoop, hops up on it and looks out. Now, you're a trained guard. You're there. It's early morning. It's still kind of dark. How to react? It says, and fear fell upon them, and the guards trembled and became like dead men. The trained fighting soldiers fell on their face. They fell like dead men for fear of the angel that showed up. But you know who didn't fall on their face? The women. They're like, now I don't know if this other Mary was Mary, the mother of Jesus. She's like, hey, what's up, Gabriel? I don't know how that went, but they didn't fall. You know why? They're on team Jesus. Because look what happened. Look what the angel says next. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who is crucified. So, so he looks at the women, says, don't be afraid. I know what team you're on. He doesn't look at them other. He doesn't tell them not to be afraid. Right? They fell down. They're not on the right team. Right? But these women, they're on team Jesus. And he starts talking to them and telling them what's going on here. He says, he is not here, for he is risen. Hallelujah. Oh, come on. That was it. That was it. <laughs> That was it. I had you ready from the very beginning. Ah, oh, let's let me try that again. All right, rewind. All right, rewind back. Right, um, he is not here. He is risen. Hallelujah. There you go. I'm sorry though. You swung and missed the first time. All right. If third service hits it, I'm gonna have to call you out. I'm gonna be like, hey, at ten o'clock service, they missed that one. No, but he is risen. How amazing is that? How amazing is it that he comes to proclaim? Look. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples, come look, but don't stay here. Come look. See the evidence. See the proof. Like, I'm not enough. I'm shining. I'm glowing. They're on their face like dead men. Like, that isn't enough. Look. He's not in there. He is risen, right? Hallelujah. Oh, yes. I snuck that one in there for you. I got to keep you awake on that one. But, man. Don't stay here. Go tell the disciples. Isn't that our message? We come and we celebrate Jesus, and then we go tell others about it. We go tell our family. We go tell our friends. We go tell our coworkers, our neighbors. We go say, man, it's an incredible story that happened. This man came and lived an impeccable life and died for our sins, but he had victory over the grave. We can all have that eternal life if we put our faith in him. What an amazing story this is. Then he tells them to go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him. See, I have told you. It has been spoken. So they departed quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy. And they ran to tell the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, greetings, shalom, right? And so they're running. They've just left the tomb, and they're running in great joy and fear, right? Don't get that. Fear and great joy, and they come, and there's Jesus. They get to have an experience 
with Jesus, and they see him, and they fall down on their face before him. It says, and they came up, and they took hold of his feet, and they worshiped him. And then Jesus said to them, do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. There you'll be in a boat, and I'll be on the shore. Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? And the, the women run and tell the disciples. But guess what? There's one reaction from these women, and they get to experience Jesus, but there's another reaction by the guard. While they were going, behold, some of the guard went into the city and told the chief priests all that had taken place. And when they had assembled with the elders and taken counsel, they gave a sufficient sum of money to the soldiers. And they said, tell the people his disciples came by night and stole him away while, he was, while we were asleep. And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So it seems like they ran to the chief priest. So it seems like maybe they're the Jewish guard. But then they say, but we'll keep you out of trouble with Pilate. So it sounds like they might be Roman. This is the, the, the debate that goes on. So they took the money and they did as they were directed. And this story has been spread among the Jews to this day. Why is Matthew telling us so much about the guards? Because they're spreading the lie that the disciples stole the body. But it made me think, how can these chief priests miss it? H how can their hearts be so hard that after they yelled, crucify him, he comes back to life? He said, three days later, not rise. They quoted him earlier, and now it happens, and they still harden their heart and bribe the people around them. I mean, he's fed 5,000 He's fed 4,000. He's walked on water. He's calmed the storm. He's healed people right in front of them. When the lame man with his hand, it comes out while he's in the synagogue. The blind man, blind from birth, healed, has to go before these chief priests and testify about what Jesus has done for him. They see the paralytic pick up the mat and walk out. They've seen him be gentle with children, inviting them to him, but at the same time refuting every challenge they threw before him. Who should we pay taxes to? Give to God what is God and give to Caesar what is Caesar. We've seen Jesus' this incredible character, and yet their hearts are so hardened. They see the darkness fall. They feel the earthquake. They see the curtain in the temple torn in two. The guards see the angel on the rock, and yet they still tell the lie. They still can't see it. Ooh, I pray that we will have the joy and the excitement of these women that see the, the Lord and they run to go tell others and not the hardness of the heart. But if we're honest, if we were to look in the mirror, sometimes we're on this team. You know, we think, man, when I wake up in the morning, am I just so excited to be in the word, to be in prayer, to commune with my father? Am I so excited about that? Or let me check the sports from last night, or let me check that YouTube, or let me do this. How often we harden our own heart, and we miss the joy of our salvation. We miss the joy of having Jesus and his resurrection from the grave. So I know we're going to celebrate that today. And I pray that you have an amazing time with your family today, just celebrating and remembering what Christ has done for us. But let's celebrate that every day. Day after day, remember Christ's sacrifice for us. So can we, get to, can we pray? But as we do, do you mind us joining hands with your family or just connecting with some people that are around you? Because we are the church, bound together, brothers and sisters in Christ because of what he has done for us. Um, let's pray together. Lord, we are your church, here to be witnesses to the glory and the majesty, Lord, of your resurrection. Lord, thank you for all that you did for us on the cross, taking our sin, despising the shame, carrying all of that weight so that we could have a relationship with you. Lord, I pray that day after day we'll remember to have a relationship with you. Lord, if there's people here who have never surrendered to Christ, Lord, I pray that they'll surrender today. Lord, I pray that every day I'll surrender my will to your will. So, Lord, guide us. I pray for each family that is represented here. Lord, bind them together in you. Help them, Lord, to feel um, the closest that can only come through your spirit bonding us together. Lord, I pray that you'll give them a day that is blessed by you, where they can celebrate the love that they have among their family, but also celebrate what you did for us on the cross and how you have conquered death. Lord, thank you for this gift of eternal life. Help us to live every day like it's in the forefront of our mind. 
Lord, we give you all the glory and all the praise. To the risen King Jesus, amen. All right, good morning, church. I want to say again, thank you all very much for being here today. Uh, the invitation has been given. If you want to talk to anyone, the pastors are around, please grab one of us. We'll give you this parting verse. John eleven twenty five. 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. It, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Be blessed and have a wonderful day. Amen.